The focus of this lesson is on describing the electronic, vibrational, and spin structure of excited states. And all three of these aspects of structure are important for excited states when we start trying to connect structure to dynamics. Electronic structure refers to the shapes, energies, and occupations of the orbitals within the molecule, the molecular orbitals. Vibrational structure refers to the nature of vibrational modes, how closely they're spaced, which ones are occupied, and what's happening as a vibration takes place within a particular mode. And spin structure refers to the spins in particular of the unpaired electrons in the excited state. We've seen that singly occupied or half-filled molecular orbitals are key to excited states, and the nature of the electron spins of those unpaired or singly occupying electrons is key. Let's start with electronic structure. So we're going to use a system for describing electronic structure of organic molecules in this course that is a zero order approximation to the true electronic structure. And the beauty of this, as we've said, is that we can develop a picture of the electronic structure on the back of a napkin and using nothing but our brains and a few simple rules. And it's a pretty robust description of the actual electronic structure, particularly in cases where the Lewis model of structure with electrons and bonds and non-bonding lone pairs holds up well, which is true for a large number of organic molecules. And if we're willing to separate sigma and pi systems, an even larger set of electrons within molecules. The orbital theory we're going to make use of most is called the natural bond orbital or NBO theory. And the beauty of natural bond orbital theory is that it is very closely related to the Lewis structural model. And so we can develop an NBO picture, an electron configuration involving NBOs, just from a Lewis structure. And we can go in the opposite direction. And we will also do this starting from an electron configuration and working backwards to what we might call a natural Lewis structure for an excited state. And this is actually an important goal of the course, being able to look at the electronic configuration of an excited state and work backwards in some sense to a Lewis structure. Now, natural bond orbitals can also be calculated from a given wave function, say, determined by um, computational geometry optimization and calculation of, of canonical molecular orbitals. NBOs can be derived from that. These will look very similar, if not identical, to the NBOs we would develop just by following the simple rules that we'll develop here. A key foundational principle of this system is that every natural bond orbital that we find within the electron configuration for a molecule corresponds to a visible element of the Lewis structure. This means that we can move logically from the Lewis structure, logically and deductively, to the NBO electron configuration. And the way we do that is by connecting elements of the Lewis structure, bonds and non-bonding lone pairs, to orbital shapes to a standard set of orbital shapes that are very small in number. In fact, there are essentially only six standard orbital shapes in the NBO system, and we're going to list them here and talk about a couple of wrinkles on the next slide involving polarization and delocalization effects. But by and large, this is a very robust and, and very simple system for elaborating an electron configuration that is a zero order approximation to the truth using only our intuition and chemical knowledge. So what are the NBO orbital shapes? What's the standard set? Well, there are six, and we can divide them into electron sources and electron sinks. When thinking about reactivity in a ground state organic chemistry context, I often think this way in terms of sources and sinks. It may also be helpful just to simply mention that electron sources are the filled natural bond orbitals. These contain electrons. Generally speaking, if we're talking ground state reactivity, they may be SOMOs in an excited state. And the electron sinks are empty NBOs. And generally speaking, these are lacking electrons in ground state configurations, but may be SOMOs in an excited state. And so typically, for example, the electron sinks are anti-bonding, while the electron sources are bonding, right? And actually, either may be non-bonding. So empty p orbitals, for example, fall over here on the electron sink side. Non-bonding hybrid orbitals fall over here on the electron source side. And actually, both of those may be SOMOs in an excited state. In any event, let's now survey the NBO orbital shapes. The first is the non-bonding lone pair. 
And this corresponds to a pair of electrons that are drawn in a Lewis structure very straightforwardly. So for example, we can recognize the presence of a lone pair in this structure of NF3 located on the nitrogen atom and immediately draw the picture you see here of a non-bonding orbital that looks like this. This is a standard shape, including this kind of little back nub you see for a non-bonding lone pair orbital. And furthermore, what we should note at this point is that this is essentially just an sp3 hybrid orbital, right? An sp3 hybrid located on the nitrogen, and this is typical. The vast majority of non-bonding lone pair orbitals are hybrid orbitals. So you see a pair of electrons, you can make the connection that a non-bonding lone pair orbital is located on the atom in question where that lone pair resides. Every pi bond, the second or third bond of a double or triple bond, can be associated with a pi bonding orbital. And every pi orbital looks like this. It has this kind of hot dog shape, we might say. I always think pi orbitals look like hot dog buns. And it's made from two p orbitals perpendicular to the molecular plane, overlapping side by side, like this. So anytime you see a pi bond, you can connect it to a picture that looks like this. The orbital has a node in the molecular plane and opposite phase density on either side of the plane. At this point, you may know where this is going. Every single bond can be associated with a sigma bonding orbital. So here, for example, we see a carbon-carbon bond in ethane that can be associated with a sigma bonding orbital, and every sigma bonding orbital has this basic shape. Coaxial symmetry, symmetry about the bonding axis. We can rotate around the bonding axis and the shape of the sigma bond will not change. Large density between the nuclei, it's a bonding orbital, and tiny nubs on the outside, generally there because this was made from the overlap of hybrids, right? So again, anytime you see a sigma bond, you can associate it with this general orbital shape. Now what about the unfilled electron sinks? Well, again here, there are three, and the first is a non-bonding orbital that is empty, which we'll refer to as A, or empty atomic orbital is what the A stands for. And these can be associated with an atom that bears only six electrons, what we might call an unsaturated atom, like the boron you see right here. And the orbital shape depends on the specific situation to some extent, but by and large the most common shape for an empty A orbital is an empty P orbital perpendicular to the molecular plane. So that's what's going on in BF3, that's what's going on in trigonal carbocations, so on and so forth. So again, anytime you see a six electron atom like this with a trigonal geometry, we can connect that to the visual representation of an empty 2P orbital shown right here, and we represent that with the lowercase letter A. Now we talked about pi bonding orbitals associated with pi bonds, we can also associate pi bonds in Lewis structures with pi antibonding orbitals, and these have the general shape you see here. They're similar to pi bonding orbitals in that they have density above and below the molecular plane and, and kind of a hot dog sort of shape. However, they have a node perpendicular to the molecular plane between the nuclei and, and opposite phases on either side of that node. So this leads to a kind of butterfly shape for the pi star or pi antibonding orbital. And again, every time you see a pi bond, it's worth keeping in mind that visually speaking, a pi antibonding orbital is associated with that Lewis structural element. Generally, these are empty, so they won't directly figure into, say, the filled electron configuration, but keeping in mind that that's there is important. And remember, in excited states, this could be a SOMO. This could be a singly occupied molecular orbital in an excited state, and this is very, very common. Finally, we can associate every sigma bond or single bond in a Lewis structure with a sigma antibonding orbital. So for example, CC single bond in ethane can be associated with this sigma antibonding orbital, and these have the general shape shown here. They often look like two hybrids or two p orbitals pointing directly at each other, but with opposite phase, so that there is a node perpendicular to the bonding axis between the nuclei, opposite phases on either side of that node, and very large lobes outside of the nuclei, sort of the inverse of the sigma bonding orbital with these large lobes on the outside. And that's it.
These are the six standard orbital shapes of NBO theory. Using these shapes, we can go from a Lewis structure to an electron configuration by asking how many of each type of electron are there, what atoms are they located on or between for non-bonding and bonding electrons respectively, and what in particular low energy, what low-lying electron sinks or empty NBOs are associated with the Lewis structure. Although those don't figure directly into the electron configuration in terms of filled electrons, they become important when we start thinking about excited states. Now there is one wrinkle here that we need to address. For the bonds we've looked at so far, the atoms involved have been identical, so the bonds are not polarized. However, the vast majority of bonds involve two atoms of different electronegativity, which results in an asymmetric electron distribution. One side of the bond has greater electron density than the other side, so there's partial charge, and the orbital shapes become skewed. And so we can talk about polarization toward one side or the other, meaning a larger lobe on one side or the other. For filled NBOs, for electron sources, they are polarized towards the more electronegative atom in the bond. So their larger lobes show up on the more electronegative atom because there's greater electron density on that atom, right? It's more electronegative. Conversely, and this makes a great deal of sense, empty NBOs are polarized toward the less electronegative atoms. So unfilled antibonding orbitals tend to have larger lobes on the less electronegative atom this is the more electrophilic atom, the more partially positive, and so the larger lobe shows up on that atom for empty or unfilled NPOs. Let's look at some examples. So the pi star orbital of the carbonyl group is a great example of this. Carbon is less electronegative than oxygen. If we think about the polarization and, and partial charges involved in this bond, it becomes clear that the carbon is partially positive and the oxygen partially negative, and one of the reasons for that is the pi star orbital has a much larger lobe on the less electronegative carbon atom than on the more electronegative oxygen atom. That follows the second principle here. Empty NBOs are polarized toward the less electronegative atom in the bond. We see a similar effect coming into play, although a little bit less pronounced, in the sigma star orbital for the CO double bond. So notice here that there is a slightly larger lobe on carbon than on oxygen, again owing to the electronegativity difference here. In the carbon-fluorine sigma bond, fluorine is much more electronegative than carbon, and so we have this kind of bond polarization. And here the effect is, again, somewhat subtle, but there is a polarization of this sigma bonding orbital toward the more electronegative fluorine. So this is a filled NBO, filled sigma bonding orbital and it is polarized in shape toward the more electronegative fluorine atom in accordance with our principle. And if this one is a little bit difficult to see, we can actually look at the coefficients of the orbitals involved in building this sigma orbital to verify this. So we can see, for example, that the coefficient on fluorine, 0.86, is much larger than the coefficient on carbon at only 0.51, which indicates greater orbital density, greater electron density on fluorine than carbon. This NBO system is not just useful because it provides us with a visual picture of where the electrons are in the molecule. It also provides us with a general sense of the relative energies of electrons in molecules. And the key idea is that the energy of electrons in NBOs tends to increase in the order that you see here, with sigma orbitals being the lowest and sigma star orbitals being the highest in energy. So as a general orbital energy diagram, we can write sigma orbitals at the bottom, pi orbitals above those. Both of these are bonding in character, so it makes sense that they would show up at lower orbital energy than the non-bonding n and a orbitals. These are generally filled, so let's throw some electrons in to remind ourselves of that. The a orbital comes next, followed by the pi star orbital and the sigma star orbital, and again, these are anti-bonding, and so it makes sense that these anti-bonding orbitals would be higher in energy now than the non-bonding A and N orbitals. This becomes useful when we start thinking about electron jumps between NBOs and how we should order the energies of various excited states. For example, if a molecule has both N and pi electrons 
it makes sense to argue that the n to pi star excitation is going to require lower energy light than the pi to pi star excitation, which is going to involve orbitals that are farther apart in energy. This is our zero order guess of the situation. Now, it is worth pointing out a caveat at this point, that this is a zero order guess. And the profound thing that it ignores is electron delocalization. The system assumes that electrons are living on one atom, in the case of the n orbital, or between two atoms, in the case of the sigma and pi orbitals. In cases where delocalization matters, the system breaks down to some extent, and we need to consider first order corrections. And that will involve, for example, thinking about configurational mixing, a situation where we can't really say the n pi star and pi pi star excitations are actually independent of one another as the true excited state is a mix of the two resulting configurations. We'll cross that bridge to when we come to it. We'll absolutely see these ideas in action, including the zero order approximation and, and how useful it can be. And just to kind of foreshadow where we're going with this, this is profoundly relevant to the photochemistry of the carbonyl group which includes both n electrons located on the oxygen atom and pi electrons associated with the CO double bond. For ketones that are highly delocalized, for example, say we had a naphthyl group here, which is a relatively large delocalized aromatic structure, the zero order approximation is gonna break down to some extent and we're gonna to need to introduce some additional ideas, first order corrections to understand the nature of the electronic configuration of the excited state of this molecule.